destroy an entire generation of people's culture. It's as if they never existed. As also you have heard yesterday at the press conference in Greece, we have experienced the bad side of the war. And due to Elgin and whatever he did in Greece, um, we don't have uh, our original uh, marbles in our country. I would like your comment. Do you think that there are some other kind of monuments men right now that they can help countries get back what they really um, own? I think that would be great. I think that's what should happen. Mm -hmm. I think those, you know, I think Greece should get all of that back. Mm -hmm. You worked in the. I think you have a very good case to make about your your uh, artifacts, and I think it wouldn't be a bad thing if they were returned. I think that's a good idea. Um, I think that would be a, a. I think that would be a very fair, very nice if we thing got to happen. In your museum, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's the right thing to do. For the motion, Stephen Fry, writer, actor, broadcaster, you name it, he's done it all, is going to be arguing for the motion. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I was very disappointed. Dear Tristram um, Hunt, who's a marvellous uh, MP and a splendid man and a very fine historian, he actually used the phrase slippery slope. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> The very fact we want to return the freezes and the metapays of what now everybody is far too embarrassed, only very recently, to call the Elgin marbles. Um, the very fact we want to return them to the place where they were born um, does not mean that the Rosetta Stone is going to go back to Egypt. Uh, as has already been said, the idea that a museum is some whole, perfect, finished Victorian idea of a kind of... Um, a pantechnicon of all world knowledge is nonsensical. Like all things, it changes. And my proposal to you is very simple. How classy it would be if you went in to the British Museum and in the place where now you see the friezes that Elgin took, you saw a film of how they were cast, because they can be cast, unlike a painting, you can only photograph. So what you would see when you went to the British Museum, you would see a period, 200 years, in which we curated them beautifully. And they will then see the journey of these extraordinary pieces of pentelic marble being returned to within five miles of Mount Pentelica, where the, where the marble was quarried and where that extraordinary temple, the Parthenon, was erected to Pallas Athene, the goddess of Athens. The reason it's important in Athens is because it's all about Athens. There are 192 soldiers on the friezes because 192 soldiers died at the Battle of Marathon. And it was between the Battle of Marathon and their own defeat at, at the hands of the Spartans, between that period, Periclean Athens, that saw the rise of everything that our culture now depends on philosophy, logic, Euclidean mathematics, empiricism, a refusal to take on trust anything that is told to you. Socrates died by that principle. History, algebra, astronomy, Justice, the Areopagitica, the hill up to which they went to dispense their justice. Every citizen available to do it. By no means was it a perfect society. Women did not have equal rights. Pederasty was rife. But heck, I was at a public school. There's nothing new there. <laughs> so, the fact is, everything our enlightenment is predicated upon Athens. And around that time, the enlightenment it so happened the Ottoman Empire had completely overtaken Greece. Now, the idea that it was a legitimate purchase by John Bruce, <laughs> the Earl of Elgin, is like saying the American ambassador to the Netherlands went to Amsterdam when the Nazis had invaded and did a deal with the Nazi ruler of Holland to buy Rembrandt's Night Watch. And it was all signed, yes. Uh, we, are, we are the Germans, we own Holland, we are, they are under our occupation, and uh, you can have it, it's yours. And then the con Congress then said, yep, yep, it's perfectly legal, we now own the Night Watch.
Greece was under occupation nine years after. Nine years after Elgin took those, raped those beautiful and extraordinary pieces of history, Byron died to that cause. There are more statues of Byron in, in, in Greece than there are in Britain. And the Greeks started their war of independence against the Ottoman Empire, which they eventually won in the 1830s, 1832, I think it was. So we're not talking about some simple business of an English ambassador doing a deal with a legitimate government who gave him the right to take away the stones of the temple that absolutely characterized and personified the greatest civilization the world had yet seen, the one on which ours is predicated. And all I'm saying to you is, wouldn't it be classy if we as Britons said, yes, for 200 years, it's true, we've saved it. Uh, if, if my neighbor has a fire, uh, and, uh, and, and I go over and I say, well, look, I'll take the paintings a bit before they get burnt, and I'll put them in my garage. And they come back three years later and say, can my paintings back? Oh, no. Oh, no, you can't have them back. They'd be burnt if I hadn't taken them. <laughs> that's, that's no argument. That's just beastliness. <laughs> it's just beastliness. And perfidious Albion, which is the name by which Britain has been known for so long, this, this untrustworthy country that still has colonial ambitions, let's not be that anymore. Let's be a classy country. Let's make an exhibition in the British Museum of which Britons could be fantastically proud, which shows our curation of these extraordinary marbles and also shows their transportation back to the magnificent new Acropolis Museum where they can be reunited, not in the same temple, because that could never happen, but where within, through the glass, in the blue light of Greece, a country struggling desperately under debt, we can show them that no matter how much their sovereign debt crisis means they owe us, we will never, ever, ever be able to repay the debt that we owe Greece. Thank you.